So this is our ProSite machine where we run our CBCs. So general maintenance on this machine is there is a stain kit that's located right here in this compartment that we change out usually every couple months. The machine itself actually lets us know when it needs to be changed out. And then down below the machine, we have the machine's reagent kit that we also change out every couple months. Other than just cleaning the exterior of the machine, we do run a rinse cycle on it to just clean the inside compartments of the machine as well and then also quality control is run on it every couple of months as well. So when a monthly rinse cycle needs to be run on the ProSite, it does alert us with a notification. It just tells us to dispense two mils of the IDEX cleaning solution or you can make your own using a 5% bleach solution. We already have a 5% bleach solution already made up and we use 20 mils of water and one mil of bleach to get our 5% solution. So all I'm gonna do is take two mils of the solution and put it into a clean container. I'm gonna leave the lid off and then place it into the machine and just press the button and that's all you have to do for a rinse cycle. So once I've gotten my blood sample, I'm gonna take my heartworm test, just open it up. And this is what the test looks like. So the heartworm test comes with a conjugate and I'm gonna do four drops of this conjugate. One, two, three, four. And then take three drops of my sample and I just invert the sample a couple of times to mix it thoroughly. I'm gonna take my sample and put it right here in this hub. And it usually takes 30 to 60 seconds for the sample to travel down before it is snapped. Once the sample reaches this circle, I'm going to snap the test. I'm gonna let this sit for eight minutes and we'll come back and read the results. So I'm gonna be demonstrating how to do a fecal flotation, fecal flotation and centrifuge, a direct smear and then also sedimentation. The first thing I'm gonna do is put some gloves on because when you're handling fecal material, you're always at risk for getting a zoonotic disease. So we're going to wear gloves. I do have a two gram sample here and then also some sodium nitrate solution. This is what I'm gonna to use to float the sample. So I'm gonna take the fecosol and I'm going to mix it in this container and then just take a fecal loop and mix the sample with the solution. So once my sample is mixed, I'm going to take my flotation cup and some gauze just to strain out the large particles. I'm just going to pour the sample into the cup. So all the larger particles are going to get stuck in the gauze and I'm just going to throw this away. I'm going to take the sample and I'm going to fill it to the top until there's a little bubble. I'm going to take a cover slip and just place it right on top. I'm going to let this sample sit for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll come back and read the sample. Okay, now I'm going to do a fecal flotation with centrifuge. I'm going to put some gloves on again. <laughs> and I'm basically going to do the same thing that I just did. So I have a 2 gram fecal sample. I'm going to mix it with some fecosol. I'm just going to mix this sample again with a fecal loop. Then I'm just going to take another empty container to just strain the liquid into. I'm going to take just a 4x4 four four gauze, place it over the lid, and then I'm just going to strain my sample through. So my solution with the large particles, I'm just going to throw away. Then I'm going to take this tube that has no solution in it. I'm just going to pour this sample. And it fills it about halfway. So I'm going to get the fecal solution and fill it just a little bit more, but leaving a little space at the top. I am going to put the cap on. I'm going to take this and go centrifuge it. Okay, so our centrifuge does has a setting for fecals. So I'm just going to put it on that setting and let this spin for about five to 10 minutes. So this is what your sample looks like once it has been centrifuged. Your sediment is down at the bottom. Okay, right, now I'm gonna take this sample and just take the top off of it. And then I'm gonna fill it until I get a bubble just like before. Take a cover slip and place it on top. And I'm just gonna wait for 10 to 15 minutes just like last time. Now I'm going to demonstrate how to do a direct smear. So when you do samples like this, you're looking for abnormal bacteria. You can see things like Campylobacter or Giardia protozoas. I'm going to take some saline and just put a couple drops on a slide. Take my sample and I'm just going to mix the sample. 
So it's not too thick, but I do have some fecal material on the sample. Any large particles you want to discard. I personally like to put a drop of stain on my sample. It just helps me read it a little bit better. And then I'm going to put a cover slip over the solution. I'm going to demonstrate how to do sedimentation. This is done usually on large animal parasites because the eggs of those parasites are too heavy to float. So I have my two gram sample. I'm just going to add some water to this sample. Once my container is just filled with water, I'm going to mix the sample. I'm going to take some gauze and place it over a clean container and just strain my sample through. Go ahead and discard all of this. Then I'm going to pour that sample into another container. I'm going to fill it until there's just a little bit left up at the top. Put the top on it and then I'm going to centrifuge the sample. So once the solution has spun for five minutes, it'll look like this. So I'm just going to take off all this extra fluid. You can either pour it or pipette it out. I'm just going to pipette it out. I pipetted the extra fluid off without disturbing the sediment down at the bottom. So I'm just gonna take a fecal loop and take the first layer off of this sample. I'm gonna just place this on a slide. Then I'll place a cover slip over the sample and then just examine the sample for parasites. So for my serological testing, I'm gonna be using our catalyst. On this particular patient, my doctor just wants electrolytes ran on him. So I'm gonna take a serum sample. I'm just gonna fill the sample cup with the required amount of serum. And all I do to run a blood chemistry on this machine is I open up the drawer, I place my sample right here in the sample container, and then I take my electrolytes. And I'm gonna place the slides right here, push it in and then press the button and that is gonna run my electrolyte test. So once my blood chemistries are done processing, it comes to this machine where you can view the results. It will also automatically print out as well. So for these electrolytes, this is my reference range. I have a low, normal, and high. So this guy, his electrolytes are a little bit low. It does have the exact numbers and the reference intervals and then also a visual scale here. I'm gonna be performing a ear cytology on this dog. I'm just gonna hold the outside of her ear. I'm gonna get my swab and go right down into her canal until I I get a good sample. Since I got this swab from the left ear, I am going to break the end of the Q-tip just so I know which one is which. And then I'm going to get a swab from the right ear as well. So I'm gonna take my sample and I also have a slide that I have labeled left so I can keep track of which one is which. And I'm just gonna take my sample and I'm going to roll it onto the slide just like this. And then I'm gonna take my right ear sample on my slide that's labeled right and roll that sample onto the slide just like before. I'm gonna take my sample and put it in to the first one for 20 seconds, this one for 30 seconds, and then this one for 40 seconds. Once I'm done staining the slides, I'm going to gently rinse the excess stain off the sample. So you can allow your slides to air dry or you can gently blot them. I'm gonna first get my slide in focus using the 10X power. And once I can visualize the cells, I'm going to move to the 40X power to be able to read the slide. So this patient actually has a pretty bad bacterial infection in his ears. I see a bunch of cocci. So I'll let my doctor know so we can treat his ear infection. <laughs> we're gonna be performing a necropsy on this cat. We do have gloves, our gowns, and we're both gonna be wearing masks. Dr. Custer is going to be using a necropsy knife. I do have a suture pack and then also a tin blade that she will use. All right, so history on this cat is that it was adopted from the local animal shelter by a couple. It was the only cat in the household. They had it for about a week. Uh, he was neutered the day before he had been adopted. Came in for a general wellness check, which included a physical exam and a fecal flotation. And then at that time, the owners stated that he was having urinary incontinence. So 
what I did is I did a puncture into each joint mm -hmm. to reflect the muscles off there and then kind of skinned it back so I could see what I need to see. Now she's going to do her midline incision. Now what I'm doing is bread loafing each uh, organ just to kind of get a visual, see where I want to take my samples, if there's anything um, that's not on the surface that I want to sample. So I'm going to label both these jars, spleen and liver, with the patient's name, the date, and then we'll send these off to the lab. When dealing with a rabies suspect, only vaccinated personnel is allowed to come into direct contact with the patient. Also, affected animals can only be handled by a person that is wearing gloves, a surgical mask, and protective eyewear. After handling a rabies suspect, it's very important that you wash your hands thoroughly. To test for rabies, all rabies suspects have to be decapitated, except for bats. The specimen should be placed in a watertight container such as a heavy plastic bag that is tightly secured with a tight fitting lid to prevent fluid leakage. Then that container should be placed into another larger waterproof container. Then that container needs to be placed into a, another waterproof unbreakable container. And the space between the two containers need to be packed with ice coolers. So the specimen is in a different container than the container that the ice packs are in. Leaking or improperly packed specimens will not be accepted. Once the head has properly been packaged, then the rest of the body should be cremated. Today I'm going to be doing a vaginal cytology on this dog to see if she is in heat. We're going to be determining what stage of estrus that she's in. I'm going to be doing a vaginal wash with some sterile saline first to just get rid of the debris. I'm going to take a sterile cotton swab and moisten it with some sterile saline. I'm going to hold her vulva and I'm going to advance the swab vertically and then horizontally into her vagina and then just swab the inside until I get a good sample. I'm going to take this swab and put it directly on a slide and then we'll stain it and look at the cells. I'm going to take that slide and wait until it's completely dry and then I will stain it. I'm going to do 20 dips, 30 and then 40. So when I'm looking at these cells, I'm looking at the size of the nucleus. These cells are further categorized based on their size and their degree of cornification. So I'm basically looking to see how big the nucleus is compared to the cytoplasm of these cells. The bigger the nucleus, the further away from being in heat that she is. So this cell is cornified while this one is not. So this is the different stages that it's going to go through when going into heat. So the degree of cornification on these cells, I would say that she's in an estrus because the cells are predominantly non-cornified squamous epithelial cells which means that she's not going to be going into heat anytime soon she's not an ideal candidate to be bred I'm gonna be performing a skin scrape on this dog so I'm just gonna take a dull tin blade and I have a slide here that I'm gonna add some mineral oil to and then I'll take the blade and just scrape the skin until I get a little bit of bleeding just to make sure I got underneath the hair follicle and once I start to get a little bit of blood I'm going to mix it in with the mineral oil and just scrape it off on the sides and then I'll take the slide and look at it underneath the microscope. So once I have my skin scrape I'm going to look at it under the microscope. I'm going to look at it on the 10x power. I'm looking for two types of mange either sarcoptic or Demodex. So other than hair follicles and some blood, I don't see any mites. So I would say this skin scrape is negative. I'm going to be performing a cross match agglutination test today. So I have two different samples. I have my donor and then also my recipient. This blood has been centrifuged and I took the serum and I separated it into two different tubes. And then I also have an EDTA from the donor and the recipient that has also been centrifuged. So I'm going to remove the plasma from each EDTA. ETA tube so that the only thing that remains is the packed red blood cells and I'm gonna remove the plasma from each sample so now the only thing that remains is the packed red blood cells at the bottom of each sample then I'm gonna take two drops from my recipient and put that into a clean test tube that is labeled recipient one two and then I'm gonna repeat the same process for the donor. I'm just gonna take two drops of the donor packed red blood cells and then add it to a clean test tube labeled donor. 
one, two. And so this is what the two samples look like. So I have two syringes filled with saline, exactly three mils, and I'm gonna add that to both samples. So this is the donor sample, and I'm just gonna add three mils of saline to this sample. So it looks like this, and then I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the recipient sample. Just add three mils of saline to this one as well. I'm gonna mix both samples gently. So now I'm gonna centrifuge both of these samples for one minute at about 34 RPM. So this is what the samples look like once they have been centrifuged. And what I'm gonna do is decant the supernatant, which is the clear from the packed red blood cells at the bottom, and I'm just gonna discard the supernatant from both samples. So I'm just gonna repeat that same process of washing each sample two more times. Why wouldn't she do it? So this is the second wash. I'm just gonna decant the supernatant and then take two drops from each and then redo the process all over again. <laughs> so once I have repeated that process three times, I'm going to take 0.02 of each vial and put it in here and I'm gonna mix it with 0.98 of saline. So I'm gonna add 0.98 of saline to each vial. And then I'm gonna take 0.02 of the packed red blood cells. And I'm gonna add that to the final wash. And it should look like that. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the donor sample. Add that 0.2 to this sample as well. It should look just like that. So this is what the final wash looks like from both the donor and then also the recipient. So I'm gonna perform the major cross match. I'm gonna take two drops of the recipient's serum and two drops of the donor's cell suspension in a new tube labeled major cross match. So this is my recipient's serum and I'm just gonna take two drops of this and put that into the major cross match and then take two drops of the donor cell suspension and then add that to the major cross match one two and i'm just going to mix this gently and set it aside for the minor cross match i'm going to take two drops of the donor's serum and two drops of the recipient's cell suspension so this is the donor's serum one, two. Change out my pipette tip. Then I'm gonna take the recipient's cell suspension, two drops of that into the minor cross match. One, two. I'm just going to invert this and then set it aside. For my control, I'm gonna take the donor's cell suspension and I'm gonna get two drops of that and I'm just gonna mix it with two drops of the donor's serum. This is my donor control. You. One, two. And I'm just gonna take two drops of the serum and mix that in the donor control. Two. I'm gonna change out my pipette tip and then take two drops of the recipient cell suspension and put that in my control. One, two. And then take two drops of the recipient's serum and put that in my control as well. One, two. Okay, so now I have four tubes. I have my minor cross match, then I have my major cross match, and I have my donor control and then also my recipient control. I'm gonna let these sit for 30 minutes at room temperature. So all four tubes have been sitting here for 30 minutes and I'm gonna centrifuge all of them for one minute. So this is what the samples look like after they have been centrifuged for one minute. I don't see any hemolysis in the supernatant, but we're gonna look at it under the microscope to see if there's any signs of agglutination in these samples. Okay, so I'm gonna take a slide and one drop of the major cross match and put it on my slide and put a cover slip on top and I'm just gonna look at that underneath the microscope. So on my major cross match there is no signs of agglutination so we're gonna do the minor cross match and do the same thing with one drop and look at it under the microscope. There is no agglutination on my minor and major cross match so that means that these guys are a good pair for blood transfusion. 